thank you all for joining us today. Great, thanks, Jay, for the very warm introduction and, and a, real, a real shout out to Fredrickson Communications for sponsoring these community events. I, I don't know of any, uh, anybody in the supply chain who does a better job of bringing community together for their constituents. And we just really wanna thank you uh, for being so gracious and in, in offering these uh, these collaborative events. So uh, uh, thought leader series, gosh, you know, Ron and I have got a few things to share. We've got a little bit of expertise in the topics we're gonna talk about, uh, but by no means are we the thought leaders here. Everybody on this call is a thought leader uh, in your industries, in your companies, in your profession. So consequently, we're here to provoke thinking among really smart people. Um, and if we all leave this 90 minutes with more questions and we have answers, then Ron and I will have done our job today. So please participate, uh, chat it up, really use that chat feature, use the virtual hand, do a shout out, take yourself off, off mute if you need to, to participate. But really we, we encourage you to participate during this, this uh, conference call, uh, really challenge Jay and Mark with their facilitation skills to get all this done. Then we trust that you guys will. So, so, so what's the topic today? Work-based learning, even more important in today's fast changing workplace. Basically what we're gonna talk about three really, really big topics. Um, and, and, and basically, um, we're gonna be scratching the surface, but they do relate to one another. We have got as much for talent leaders as we do training leaders and everybody in between, because it's really a macro view that we're gonna to bring to the table in terms of what's happening in the marketplace and why we need to pay attention uh, to the selection and recruiting of candidates, retention of candidates, and then what we do with them in training once we get them. Next slide, please. So in the program, the three major topics and strategies we're gonna be talking about are sourcing workers in a very competitive market. I'm in the IT education field now, and uh, this is where I live uh, in terms of, uh, of technology workers and how to place them in programs and that sort of thing. Uh, but basically, it, comp the co competition for workers is not limited to technology and IT. It could be truck drivers, forklift drivers in the warehouse, so on and so forth. It, it is a real issue right now, sourcing workers. Then developing workers through an earn and learn model. We're gonna be challenging some conventional wisdom about your requirements for hiring. And then once you get them, how do you train them? Um, and, and so that's where Ron comes in to talk about structured OJT to really master job performance and, and operative words structured, not willy nilly stuff, but really the real deal. And Ron's gonna give us a lot of education on that. So next slide, please. So what's the problem? Um, labor is in, is in huge short supply right now across all sectors, across most occupations, quite honestly. Um, businesses can't find candidates that fit their hiring requirements. Now, a lot of the context of our conversation is gonna be about IT and technology because it's ubiquitous and everybody can relate to it, but especially in IT occupations, very, very difficult to find folks. The requirements of a college degree is proving to be a barrier. Therefore, we need to look at alternative credentials uh, to be explored. And what I mean by that is basically if you've got hiring requirements that say everyone's got to have a four-year degree or a two-year degree or a master's degree and you can't find those people, then what? We have to think about alternative pipeline channels uh, to get talent. Apprenticeship as a work-based learning strategy should be considered a solution and it is. I'll show you where that, where that fits. And then training methods such as structured OGT should be used for all work-based learning programs to assure that mastery of tasks is achieved. And the operative word there again is structured OJT. Um, we, we, we have to make sure that we're, we're bringing to the table for our talent professionals solutions that will really get the job done as they start changing their strategies to attract, select, and retain talent. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what's the problem? I'll steal something from Capital One here. What's in your wallet today to address the talent challenge? Let's talk about the competitive market, which is really driving the pain point. Next slide, please. There you go. Thank you. So uh, CompTIA is the world's largest IT trade association, and we do a lot of market research on behalf of our constituents. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of details, but I have selected some things that will really help our conversation today. So one of the pieces of research we did late recently was to ask HR professionals, what's going on in your world in terms of uh, the difficulty of hiring and retaining talent? Three out of four uh, talent professionals said that, hey, it, it's really hard to hire people, but it's gonna be more hard going, <laughs> going forward. And that's really gonna be the new norm. So 
this is a problem that is not situational. It's not just a blip on the screen. People who do this for a living say, yep, it's going to be increasingly more difficult and it's going to become the new standard of practice. So why is that? What are the things that we're bumping up against that are creating this problem? There's five things listed there in the bullets to the right. Uh, candidates have rising salary, salary expectations. They want uh, work-life balance in their work. Um, they want remote work. By the way, uh, the pandemic has served that, served that up in, in, in spades. Um, I just recently heard a, a podcast from a, a LinkedIn executive that said one in seven jobs now, job postings, are for remote workers, where pre-pandemic, it was one in 65. Huge shift in trend. And then competition for well-rounded candidates. In my field in technology, uh, technical people don't always have the soft skills or what we call a CompTIA durable skills to do the job. They need both. It's two sides to the same coin. Um, I'll tell a little, little joke. Uh, about engineers, hopefully I won't offend anybody if you're an engineer out there, but, but when you're talking to an engineer face-to-face, -face, how do you know if it's an extroverted engineer or an introverted engineer? If anybody has, I'm, I'm not going to wait for an answer. If you're talking to an introverted engineer, they're looking at their shoes. If you're talking to an extroverted engineer, they're looking at your shoes. And that's just a little illustration of how, how, how challenging it is to find people with a complete package. So we're going to talk about programs that bridge that gap. And then, of course, career advancement expectations. Uh, that's not new. That's always been part of every employer's um, process to manage. Um, and, and actually, in the technology field, you can change the word expectation and put in requirements because requirements is an order of magnitude greater. It's compulsory that these things happen or people just won't come on board. OK, next slide, please. So I've got two slides on, uh, on market data that, that drive the point home about competition for talent. Um, and everybody knows that uh, in, in technology, there's, there's these hotbeds that have developed over the years. Um, uh, a lot of talent is moving out of California, out of Silicon Valley and going to states and setting up shop that, that become then again, technology centers. Um, Arizona is one of those. Um, Texas, Utah, Colorado, Florida, the entire Eastern seaboard, by the way, because of all the government, military, Department of Defense uh, work that's being done there. There's all these hotbeds. And so when you look at Arizona, not only is that a, is that a, a com competitive place for talent, but also looking at specific markets like Phoenix within that. So this is just an illustration. It could apply to a lot of different places that I just mentioned. So if you're a, a candidate who is technology oriented, and maybe has the soft skills, durable skills, as well as the engineering skills, and you went to this, go into this market, these are the types of companies that are vying for you. And you look at that list and you're kind of astounded. These are all Fortune 500, or some kind, in some ways, Fortune 100 or Fortune 50 companies that are looking for you as a talent. And they're not limited to one sector. Um, technology is ubiquitous in every company and every sector. So it's not just a technology company that's looking for these. They're every sector in the marketplace. And there's eight listed here from retail to consulting to financial. So this is a problem for everybody in every company, regardless of where, where you're coming from. Um, next slide, please. When you drill this down into the talent recruiter's office, you'll see that they're doing job postings and the job postings that reflect demand as a surrogate for demand, are, are increasing exponentially year over year. So you look at the types of jobs that, that people are, are trying to hire for and the numbers involved with that. And then you look to the right and you see the year over year change in the percentage of jobs for those positions uh, that have increased. And again, it's exponential growth. So, th so, so think about recruiting in this marketplace. You have to change your requirements if you're going to try to source these jobs and you've got to become much, much more inclusive or you're just not going to find the talent. Now, by the way, that IT project support specialist job at the beginning or at the top that has the 1400% year over year change, that's an entry level position. Um, that just requires zero to two years of experience and, and look at the demand that's out there. It, it's amazing. So next slide, please. So we gotta look at things differently, much, much differently. We have to change the paradigm um, to, to be more inclusive, 
uh, or, or we're just not going to be able to source these jobs in any way, shape, or form. For those of you that are old enough who have used maybe a single lens reflex camera, the old cameras were used to actually load film in and snap pictures. There were two settings that, that needed to happen before you could snap a picture. You had to have the shutter speed, which is how fast and quick your, your eye blinks. And then the aperture is the adjustment that lets light in, that gives you a bigger view. And that's exactly what we're saying today is that we don't want to be operating in the world of the f-stop 8.0. We got to be at the 1.4, be, again, being much, much more inclusive and changing the paradigm in terms of how we look at candidates, which will then require different methodologies and training strategies as the training professional. So this is where talent and training and development uh, work together very, very carefully, okay? Yeah, memories of high school class, photography class. Love that, Kara, thank you. Um, so I, so I, I'm going to ask, um, Elon Musk, if you go to the next slide, to put this in perspective for us. Um, this is a two minute clip that we're gonna play. Um, and, and basically what you're gonna hear is a very traditional point of view. Someone from the audience is gonna be presenting a question to Elon. And he's gonna kind of turn that question on its backside as he looks at it through a completely different lens. So pay very close attention to the paradigm shift that Elon is talking about as he answers this question, okay? Uh, and feel free to put things in the chat too, if, if you'd like. So go ahead and play that, Mark, if you would, please. Uh, hi, my name is Julie Seven Sage, and um, Mr. Musk, you have said in the past that you think that college degrees shouldn't be that important, and that has been showed in job listings in places such as Tesla. However, in places like CIS industry, including even at SpaceX, um, in the satellite development area, many of the job listings say that you need at least a bachelor's degree and prefer at least a master's degree. So my question to you is with, um, uh, more jobs asking for higher levels of degrees the scholarships are not changing amounts and that it's getting harder and harder every year to pay tuition even with using scholarships. How can colleges and industries make it easier to afford college but at the same time being able to pay grad students and employees well and also to make sure that there is a large scale access to good colleges, especially to underprivileged communities so that everyone can be a part of the future we're building. Thank you. First of all, you don't need college to learn, it, learn stuff, okay? Everything is available basically for free. Uh, you can learn anything you want for free. It is not a question of learning. There, there is a value that colleges have, which is like, is, can somebody work hard at something, including a bunch of sort of annoying homework assignments, and still do their homework assignments, uh, and, and kind of soldier through and, and, and get it done? That's like the main value of college. And then also, you probably want to hang around with a bunch of people your own age for a while, instead of going right into the workforce. So I think colleges are basically for fun and to prove you can do your chores, but they're not for learning. There it is. I want to make sure Tesla recruiting does not have anything that says requires university, because that's absurd. But there is a requirement of evidence of exceptional ability. Like you just can't, if you're trying to do something exceptional, you must have evidence of exceptional ability. I don't consider going to college evidence of exceptional ability. In fact, ideally, you dropped out and did something. Gates is a pretty smart guy. He dropped out. Uh, Jobs is pretty smart. He dropped out. You know, Larry Ellison, smart guy. He dropped out. I'm like, obviously not needed. So, did Shakespeare even go to college? Uh, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, Basically, what we're talking about here, and, and some great chat going on here, it, 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 are we are we promoting anti-college sentiment? Of course not. Of course not. We 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 all value higher education, um, but Elon Musk has the luxury of sharing a point of view that many don't have the luxury to share, and he's proving a point. It, it's all about the paradigm shift. It's not about lowering the 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 uh, the aptitude requirement. It's really about changing the requirement, literally, that we're using to select people in order to open that aperture once again and be more inclusive in everything we do.
to select uh, uh, candidates. So um, if, if, if I may, you could just go to the next slide, please. Okay, so some interesting data here that really says, answers the question, well, what are companies doing to relax hiring requirements? And what are they doing to kind of bridge that gap uh, between maybe college and, and what the employer requires? Uh, basically, this, this is a study that, and it's a little, the print's a little bit small, so I'll, I'll make sure that we, uh, we cover it well, um, that really looks at the kind of rank order of strategies companies use to, to engage candidates or to lower requirements to get them into, or the hiring requirements to get them into the company. And four of these, of these strategies are work-based learning strategies, starting with experiential learning at the top, uh, internships, apprenticeships, and co-ops. And, and what it's measuring here is the statistical difference between IT or technology industry and other industries. So these are accentuated in technology industries where they require really smart people and they're hard to find. Point being is that is that this works and companies are doing it. It's, it's not a fad to consider work-based learning techniques to bridge the skill gap or to, in the case of apprenticeship, actually use an alternative credential to get people into the company, okay? Um, so I, I would also say that, that it, it, it's really important to understand that um, at the top of this heap, the, the expanded training for any IT field is, is really kind of boot camp kind of uh, academy kind of oriented uh, programs that people will take advantage of to again, bridge that, that, that gap between college and the requirements of the company. It's not uncommon for someone who wants to enter the IT field with a four-year degree to go to a 12 week or 24 week boot camp in cyber, for example, and then they get picked up by a company because now they have the skills that they wouldn't have gotten even with a four-year degree. So a lot of things going on here. Uh, I'll put a put a call out here to uh, to to Fredrickson. Two of the of the strategies here are uh, providing external resources um, and 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 contingent workers, which is something you guys have a lot of expertise with expertise with. So this is what companies are doing about uh, about the hiring challenge. And um, next slide, please. So, so pain points, uh, we're driving the new norm in a competitive job market. We talked about a tight labor market, shrinking talent pool, competition, so on and so forth. So now it's time to get into a breakout. And we, I would like to, to kind of wrestle this question to the ground in your breakout. What pain points do you observe in your organization and what are you doing about it? So if you're seeing these things, if they're, you know, if they're visceral, they're really apparent, um, great, let's talk about them, note them if you would. And then what are some of the things that you see your organization doing about it, okay? Mark, I'll turn it over to you. All right. We live? Yep, we're live. Okay, cool. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, Mark, thanks for facilitating that. Really appreciate it. I just have a slide up here. I'm not going to go through it, but it's just some food for thought in case you didn't get, we weren't able to think of anything in your, in your breakouts, but I highly doubt. Um, these, are, these are some things that came right out of HR Magazine in their spring edition uh, just a couple of weeks ago that people are, are doing to, uh, to deal with, a co with you know, co cope with the, with the too few workers phenomena. But we'd love to hear from you. Let's, let's take a couple of minutes. If, if, if anybody would like to share uh, what came up in your sessions, I would love to hear from you. Go ahead. Take yourself off mute. I'll go. Um... Please. We had an interesting group of, of kind of technology uh, company and mining, and I work for Red Wing Shoe Company, so all different kinds of skill sets. And, and one thing that echoed is the hourly worker. It's so difficult to find you know, hourly, hourly employees with, um, with skills. And um, as people come back to the office, you know, the, the, we can have flexibility for office workers, but how do you create flexibility for other, you know, people who've been here, who've been working the whole time and or were laid off because uh, the hotel wasn't operating at full capacity, things like that. Right. So, Thanks, Mara. Thanks so much. Thanks to your group. Somebody else. Thank you. That's a good chat here. So anybody else, please. Let's hear from a couple of people at least. Chair, um, our group talked a little bit about internship programs and really emphasizing that as a pipeline for talent, um, you know, and sometimes 
where the interview maybe doesn't, you can't, you can't see that exceptional ability, or maybe you think you do, but maybe then it ends up not being a fit. And an internship mm-hmm. is a really great way to get that hands-on. Let's see them do a project. Let's see what the outcomes are. Um, and yeah, we, we talked about kind of what our companies are doing there. Fantastic. Love it. Love it. That's one of those key strategies that we showed in our, in our graph too. Great. Thanks, Shanna. One more at least, please. I can go. Yeah. All um, right. So our group talked about kind of skilling, our, our group talked about upskilling or reskilling workers that are currently already in the workforce um, to fill, help fill that gap, as well as creating, or as well as onboarding individuals and, and kind of continuing to upskill from there as well. And mm-hmm. we also talked about or, uh, programs or, or other organizations where you that that attract talent, such as 110.org, which is mm. mentioned is focused on um, African Americans. Yes, very um, familiar. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. getting into the workforce uh, and bypassing the four-year degree. Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Any, any, any others? I don't want to close the door if, if someone's waiting to take themselves off mute. Get three I'll seconds share. to respond. Go, oh, please. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so our, our group talked about, we work for some legacy companies around the Twin Cities. And one point we talked about is shifting the mindset of managers that you don't come to this company and retire from it anymore and being open mm-hmm. to people leaving and, and treating them well when they do leave so that they come back. Mm. Love it. People re-entering the workforce, love it. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you for sharing everyone and thanks for all the great chats going on here. We'll, we'll, move, we'll move forward here. I've got a couple more slides. Now get into the next slide, Mark, is, is the sourcing. Sourcing and developing workers using an earn and learn model. Next slide, please. So, so real quick, the, the, when we talk about work-based learning, there's basically kind of three paradigms that we think about. We think about learning about work, which is very typical, providing job shadowing and career service kind of days for maybe high school kids or community college folks, where they kind of learn about work and what, and what the work environment is like. Then we talk about learning through work, which, which is really the internship co-op kind of model where you're actually going to work. Most of the time you're getting paid something. Um, and, and in doing so, you're, you're actually doing a project. So you're understanding what the whole system and operation looks like, which is great. Then you're talking about learning at work, which is really, really about apprenticeship and on-the-job training. And these are programs where you are an employee and you are being paid. Next slide, please. So real quick, what, what is an apprenticeship earn and learn model? It, it absolutely is a paid job. Uh, and you're learning an occupation. Um, so it's not just a job experience or a project where you're learning part of a job. It's really, uh, it's really a paid job, but the people that come on board are getting a percent of a prevailing wage, a percentage. Of, so let's say uh, the job pays $45,000 a year. They're probably gonna get an hourly wage equivalent of maybe $20,000 a year to start out. And by the time they matriculate that and kind of graduate from that experience, then they're at full wage. So it is a prevailing wage scale. Um, and then we, it's, it's on the job training. Uh, think about the 70, 20, 10 model. Okay. This, this is really the kind of the 70 and the 20 you're mentored through a journeyman. Um, you're only really relate learning related coursework. So you're not going to be getting that comp 101 experience that we all did as, as freshmen in our first year of college and the registered apprenticeship programs are recognized by the U S department of labor. And this is a credential. So somebody matriculates this credential and then carries it with them um, throughout every state in the union where it's recognized. And, and most of the states recognize federal, federally granted uh, apprenticeships. So it's a really great model. Um, I would also say that the point of the conversation we're having today is not to kind of go back to that trades model of apprenticeship where we're talking about plumbers, construction workers, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 electricians and that sort of thing, but really applying this model to occupations that are hard to fill like technology. And that's the field that I'm in. So, so you can go out to ONET right now, which is the US government database of occupations and find a thousand occupations listed. And if you're having trouble filling a role and you need to do something different, use an alternative pipeline strategy like apprenticeship, you should be considering this as a model to develop that pipeline uh, because there are very few occupations that can't be served through an apprenticeship model. Okay, there's great benefits there. Also internally, there's come up here in this conversation in the chat about upskilling. Apprenticeship can also be used internal to an organization to let's say take somebody from a junior position into a more senior or more complex role, like going from tech support, let's say to cyber and use that apprenticeship model to to work internal of your organization to upskill in a very regimented way. Okay, next slide, please. 
So just a real, real quick benefit around apprenticeship. The first point here about uh, lowering the risk of hiring. Generally speaking, 90% of the time, someone who gets into an apprenticeship finishes. Um, they're an employee. They can have problems and fall out like anybody, but 90% of the time they finish. And then a greater percentage of time, people stay with the organization. So if you've got a lot of turnover in some positions, especially in technology, apprenticeships will stay. The other two bullet points on that, on that slide are just kind of ROI-oriented slides. Investment, there's a lot of public-private partnerships that drive apprenticeship. Those dollars, whether they be tax dollars or private dollars, generally have a very significant return on investment when it comes to apprenticeship programs. Okay, next slide, please. This is an example of real world occupations that, that I work on in my world. Uh, basically, these are uh, entry level jobs, zero to two years, tech support specialist, network, cybersecurity support specialist, IT project manager. You can see these occupations, there's a great demand for them as measured by the job postings. And those salaries are significant. So the idea here is that we're putting people in occupations using an alternative requirement or alternative credential to a four-year degree, and they're coming out making sustainable wages, which is really, really, really important, okay? And that's, uh, that's something we have to consider. And you could put any occupation in these boxes and use apprenticeship work-based models as a means of, of getting to your endpoint, okay? Next one. So what type of work-based learning strategies do you use today or plan to use in the future? Let's, let's put this in the chat, if you will. If we can have five people participate at least to kind of help us understand if you're, if you're considering co-ops, internships, uh, experiential learning, apprenticeships where you may not have, please put some, put some chat in here. Had a high school intern, eight weeks. Perfect. Great. Super. Thanks, Mark. A couple more comments, please. I can hear the keys. Anybody? There we go. Peer coaches, super, great, fantastic. A couple more, please. Genesis Works, great, great organization, fantastic. Job swaps, career planning conversations, good internships, mentorships, fantastic. Good. Well, it sounds like people are pretty pretty well dialed in. That's fantastic. So, so we'll 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 move forward and let Ron take the stage here. But but so far, what we've done is we've 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 expressed the pain point by by looking at real market data, and it, it's not just in technology jobs that there's pain points in hiring. It could be all kinds of folks, uh, in all kinds of occupations. Thinking about apprenticeship as an alter alternative credential uh, to four year degrees, for example. And that, that model could be applied to multiple occupations. It's not just technology. Go to ONET and peruse that to see you know, what type of roles that you might want to try this, this methodology in. And now we're saying, okay, you've got them, you retain them, but because it's a work-based work learning environment, how do you train them and develop them? And that's where structured OG, OJT comes into play. So I'm going to turn it over to Ron for that topic. Thank you very much, Rich. Wow. Thank you. It's a lot of great information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I got to find my slides. What happened to my slides? Hold on just a second, everybody. I'm... You could just read your books to us. Yeah, I could just read that. <laughs> Something happened. My slide disappeared. Why I did that? Oh, geez. Mark, do you have Ron's deck available? Yeah, Ron, if you need me to throw your deck up, I can. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I don't know what happened to it. Okay. All right. Thank All you. Right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Thank you to Rich and thank you to Fredrickson for the opportunity to share information with everybody. And um, I'd like to share uh, some information about what I've been doing and um, for the past number of years. And many of you know some about my, my work as a faculty member and also in the field as well. And um, so my focus, the focus of my presentation will be on structured on the job training. My very quick agenda and the time that we have will be to look at what is structured on the job training and talk a little bit about something that I'm working on 
right now called Situate, and also to think about Situate in the context of IT apprenticeships that, that uh, Rich has been referring to. And I'm also going to share a little bit of information about something called work analysis, which is a basic fundamental aspect for understanding how to prepare for and to deliver great workforce based or work based learning. So again, if you have any comments, or questions, please use it in the chat. Um, I'll try to respond to it or we'll just kind of hold it on, hold on to it until the end of my presentation will be fine too. Some of you may not know, but uh, the word structured on the job training sort of permeates through the field a little bit, learning and development and HRD. It's something that I introduced to the field a long time ago, it seems, back in 1987, based on a project that I did when I was a faculty member at Ohio State University. And, you know, I'll just tell a very, very quick story. But, you know, I was working with a company with some students and the, the company wanted a set of videotape clips to identify, uh, to document what people had to do when they did a, a uh, series of tests in a QA lab. And it was going to be very expensive, but it was not going to achieve what the organization had wanted to achieve. And that was to have the people be able to perform the tests at the end of the training. And that's when we changed track. We went from having a video modules to actual on the job training. And that's where that idea of structured on the job training for me came about. For me, the word structured on the job training is defined by the following, and I'll be very, very brief. It's the planned process. Planned means that you're preparing, you're doing a work analysis, that you are um, analyzing the work, you're preparing the training documents, all the things that you would think about in terms of what you would do in the classroom too. So it's planned, it's not just unstructured or just happens of having an experienced employee, and that's a not, we purposely don't talk about a person who's an expert, but an experienced employee is somebody who has knowledge of the work and is also qualified to be a trainer in the work as well. And of course, a novice. A novice is a relative term. It can be anybody. It could be not only a new hire person, but it also could be person to be retrained as well. And it occurs in the actual work setting or a setting that resembles the work setting, because we know that a lot of OJT also occurs within the context of simulations, role plays, and all those kinds of things as well, and, you know, labs as well. So it does not have to be in the exact work setting, but it has to have the characteristics of the work setting. So there's about five key aspects that define for me what is structured on the job training. Some of you may be familiar in the left of a couple books that I've written on structured on the job training. There's some books from ATD and previous to that, there were some cases, case books from ASTD on le uh, learning in the workplace. And then recently I have a book 2019 on work analysis. So you might be interested in that. All the work that I do, I have reported and shared with the field and pretty much you can find in the literature sometime at some point including a lot of the case studies, a lot of the work that we've done with organizations as well. So we try to get the information out as much as possible to share with the field. Just a little brief, you know, when people think about SOJT, they think about what is, why it's important in the, work, in the workplace itself. And you can see the list there. It has to do with when things change, when there's new hires, transfers, promotions, when there's a change in products, services, or a process, when there may be specific quality or safety issues that people need to address. And then also that quality management requirements because a lot of like ISO and others like FDA, they also require documentation for the tasks, the critical tasks, and also verification that the people who serve as trainers are actually qualified to be a trainer as well. And then of course, there's issues that have to do with what's going on with your current training. And this is especially important today because what I have found and maybe you found too, and you can comment on this, is that at, as a result of COVID, people have rushed into 
in a lot of respects into online learning programs, invested quite heavily in those kinds of things. But then they found out that after doing that, people are learning, but they're not learning how to do something. And so it becomes a bit of a frustration in sense in terms of what is going on with our current training, what can we do as a result of that. I'm going to swing around to that point here in just a minute and talk when I talk a little bit about situate. But you know, even without COVID, there's still the issues about accountability, training transfer, and those kinds of things, what people bring into the workplace as a result of what they've learned in the classroom or an online environment. Over the years, and I share this with you just to give you a sense of the spread, because we've talked a lot about apprenticeships uh, at, at this point, but in the work that I've done, it, in a sense, it goes beyond apprenticeships because for apprenticeships, you're thinking about non-college type of individuals. But what about people that are in college degree programs, graduates, and are going into high levels of technical work like engineers? And so we have looked for opportunities to do cases, to do projects with organizations where that is true, not only the frontline employees and also with supervisors, that's pretty easy in terms of figuring out how to formulate a, an SOJT system for those kinds of things. But also, as you see at the very bottom of the screen here, uh, projects that we've done where we're thinking about four-year degreed new hire engineers. And uh, that's something that maybe when we think about on-the-job training, we haven't thought about that position level at you know that much to this point, but you can see that you know some of the spread of of case studies that we've been involved with. As I say, a lot of these, most all of these, are in the literature reported in somewhere. And if we have any questions, be glad to go back. You know what's happened today? Of course, we're all experiencing something pretty similar, and that has to do with how learning occurs in organizations. And just as a side note, I was reflecting on some of the slides that uh, Rich was offering at the end of his presentation. And one of the comments that I make in my SOJT book is the continuing fact that, well, you know, all of us know the state of the industry survey that ATD does, also before ATD, it was named ASTD, and that became an annual rite of passage for most people in practice because they wanted to see what the salary surveys look like for people in the field. But the point that I used to look at more than anything else was what were the most frequently used training approaches used in organizations? And the paradox for that information is that if you ask a learning and development professional, what are the most frequently used training approaches that they use, even maybe uh, this is kind of a strange, unusual year period, but they will say online learning and classroom training and all those kinds of things. That's the most important things that they use, most, most frequently used. But if you flip the coin and you ask employees, how did you learn how to do your job? Nobody ever says, I learned how to do my job by going to the training center and attending classes. <laughs> that just never comes up in the research studies where they ask people, how did they learn? How did they do their jobs? And so what they say, of course, I learned how to do my job by doing my job in the context of doing my job. And that has, you know, in, the, in what we're looking at now on the slide has a lot of meaning because there's a long tradition of learning on the job, starting with probably most of us know here a little bit about the training within industry project during World War II, where they really institutionalized OJT as something that was important for learning. I think my work builds upon the TWI, at least I think that, and I hope that's true anyhow, because there's much learning that can be done about what they did during World War II. But now I think what we have done, I think we've gone into another generation. I think we're past not only the, the having people learn one-on-one -on -one 
perhaps still one-on-one, -on -one, but face-to-face -face only. And that's a problem for many situations that might even be true with or without the, um, the COVID aspect coming up for us to have to deal with. I share a little bit of personal information. About a year and a half ago, I realized that there was going to be a problem with people continuing to use SOJT in organizations. And the question then becomes, what can we do about it? Because we know So I looked around and I was lucky enough to be connected with people that would help me develop a platform that eventually we have called Situate. And I'm not doing this from a commercial perspective, but I'm just get, telling you this, sharing this information with you from the perspective of what's happening next. And what's happening next, I think, is the concern about how to make sure that we are addressing the skills development needs of employees, whether they be apprentices or new supervisors or professionals in our organization, regardless of what they are. But how can we do that in the context of digital transformation efforts, um, the changing nature of work, and also the changing you know, view of technology as well? the introduction of digital technology as well. So what I'm showing you is the dashboard for Situate. And as I'm sharing this information with you, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, there's so much information that I've left out. I just would like to include it, but I wanna make sure that we have about 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes or so for Q and A. So we're just giving you kind of the stone skipping across the water version of all this information and would love to hear more of your questions as we get to the, to the, at the bottom here uh, at the end. The dashboard, what we've tried to do with Situate is very important because a lot of practice has to do with offering training. But one of the things that we have moved away from within the context of our field is understanding what is the work that people are doing. And so Situate goes back to the idea and is drawing upon the work that I've done in terms of giving people the skills, the templates to be able to do a job analysis, task analysis, as you can see, occupational analysis. We can talk all we want about being able to offer skills development and concern for people to be able to actually do things as a result of our training. But until we start thinking seriously about mundane topics, I admit they're a little mundane, job analysis and task analysis, it's not going to happen. It's just going to be a concern without any action to support it. So I'd like to share a little bit about that information in just a minute as well. But this is a summary of the dashboard of Situate. So it allows you to do a job analysis, to do a task analysis, to be able to develop the training guides based on the task analysis that you've done, there's a onboarding format in there as well. Uh, a train the trainer module, a qualification system that's also embedded in the software. In the Situate platform, I reflected on where were the gaps and opportunities when people do a project involving SOJT. And a lot of it has to do with preparing the materials the evaluation of trainees at the end of each training segment, being able to record that information afterwards, and to be able to manage the progress of people as they move forward. So when people ask me, is Situate an LMS? We know that there's a lot of LMS systems out there in the market. My response is no, it's really a training system because it's about how you develop the training how you deliver the training, either face-to-face -face or remotely, and how you evaluate trainee performance based on that, uh, what they have learned. And um, so that is what we're doing now, trying to give organizations and also apprenticeship systems more flexibility in terms of delivering what has to be done. 
Now, tech, uh, Rich mentioned a couple times uh, one of the occupational titles called the tech support specialist. And we've been working on that as a partner with CompTIA and also with another organization called TAG National. It's another one of those trade associations having to do with IT. And so we have developed a demonstration platform using Situate for SOJT on this occupation with the expectation that we're addressing the issues that you can see in the middle column and with the hope that we can then address some, uh, look for some of the results as we begin to roll this out in terms of helping people use the system as well. Greater consistency across apprentices, greater focus on job requirements, greater connection between OJT and uh, RTI. RTI means related technical instruction, which is a large part of most all apprenticeships is what you learn in the classroom as well or online and to better manage the process as well. So these are all important things, issues, not only within this apprenticeship, but also in other apprenticeships as well. Well, I wanna make a little bit of a transition as I uh, finish up is that one of the issues in apprenticeships, and I think this is true for perhaps in other instances as well, is that most apprenticeship programs are based on what's called an occupational guideline or an occupational analysis. And that means that the information there represents a number of different employer situations. And a lot of times when we use or when we try to use these documents, when we work with individual employers, it just doesn't work because everybody is different. And you can imagine trying to do an analysis of tech support specialists, for example, across a half a dozen employers, everybody's situation is a little bit different. And so from an apprenticeship perspective, what has to be done is that you have to convert or adapt the occupational analysis to a job analysis, identifying what are the tasks that people have to perform in a particular situation related to that occupation. So there's a step, you know, it's, it's interesting. Many companies are hesitant. There's a little fuzziness, a little employ, a few employers are a little hesitant to be involved. Part of the hesitancy is what is the relevance of what I'm doing in my organization and your expectation of what these people are supposed to be learning. I'm getting some chats here and I'm trying to look at these and move along at the same time. So <laughs> one of the important things that we've done, and this is also, I should say, on Situate, is that there's a crosswalk. So when a person does takes an occupational standard for an apprenticeship program, like for the uh, tech support specialist, you can see on the top columns, these are the competency topics that come from the occupational analysis, the guideline. And on the left row, these are the tasks that are generally done in an employer situation. And so you come up with something that's called a crosswalk. It's a matrix and it can be used for planning. It can be used for validation. It's used for accountability, making sure that what people learn in a particular employer situation matches up with what is specified in that occupational standard. It's very important to do this, especially when you have registered apprenticeships to make sure that there's some accountability for what people have learned within the employer situation. Now, all of this is based on the, the notion that you understand what is the work. And I'm not gonna go into this because we're running out of time, but you know, there's two perspectives from my view on work analysis that answers two separate questions. And I'd like for you to reflect on this a little bit. The first question is, that we ask many times in organizations is, what is the work that people do? Irrespective of who is doing the work, what is the work? And so you come up with answers like techniques called occupational analysis, job analysis, task analysis, work process analysis. 
I'm sure you've heard some of these terms before. The other side of the coin is what are the characteristics of the people who successfully do the work? In other words, you're thinking not so much about the work per se, but you're talking about who, what, who are the people? What are the characteristics of the people that make for success in a particular role that people play within an organization? And I often, you know, we have these discussions and people that I've discussed this with to make sure that both of these are important, but they can't be mixed. They have to be understood separately. But I put these arrows that go back and forth because they interact, as all of you know, when you're, especially within a selection process, that you know that people are looking for certain types of people to be able to do a certain position in your organization. And you're also looking for people who have certain abilities as well. One is on the left side of that circle and the other is on the left, the right side of that circle. So, you know, the, the idea of being able to document the work is critical. It's, a, it's not rocket science. I know that a lot of people in our field kind of shy away from this. It's not rocket science. It's just something that we have to think about a little bit more carefully when we think about what are we going to do to develop skills. There has to be some anchoring, some referent for that information. This is just a Looking at the tech support specialist, and you can see the duty statements and the particular tasks that go with those duties. And this is a result of a task analysis that it might look like within the Situate platform. So this is the training content. This is very simple. In this representation, it can get very complex. It doesn't make any difference, but we have to try our best to try to document the things that, people, that we expect people to be able to do. Well, within all that, um, this is just the various things that you can do in terms of task analysis. What I've tried to do in my brief presentation here is to make sure that we understand um, that structured on the job training is a means by which we can offer people skills development it, has, it can be blended with other forms of training, and it's an important part of what we do in terms of apprenticeships. And so this is a great opportunity to have a conversation about this, not only the apprenticeships, but also the larger component of what it is that we do in terms of providing effective training in organizations. I'll just say one more thing and then I'll quit. Coming up next week, if you want to check on the website, the uh, Situate-Training website, I offer free two-hour sessions next Friday. There's a session on Situate and apprenticeships, and you can see a little bit more about what, what we've been planning in terms of the platform and our perspective of apprenticeships, and also in terms of what we, in, in May 27th, we're doing a session on how to calculate the financial benefits uh, when you use structured on the job training. So thank you very much for your time. Look forward to your comments and conversation at this point. Excellent, Ron, thanks. Mark, I, can we turn it over to you? Yeah. Are, are we ready to open it up for questions? Mark, if I you think, could put up the, the last uh, slide. I. I'm using the wrong one here, so let me stop share. Sure thing. And Jay, I think we're ready to turn it over to questions. Okay, great. Uh, questions for um, Rich and Ron, um, perhaps Derek, could you get us started? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think so. In the realm of the context of my on-the-job training, I am one cog in a larger system here at M Health Fairview. Um, I am not responsible for the overall talent development portion, but I am responsible for the EHR, uh, technical training development. And one of the things that we're struggling with is um, helping our leaders within the organization understand that they need to make time and um, buy into the strategy of on-the-job training. And I'm just curious um, if, if you have any tips or thoughts on um, impacting that organizational desire for, for the importance of on-the-job training. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Derek. Do you have a comment, Rich? And then I'll follow. Let me up have a short there. comment, and you'll and you'll uh, follow up with the answer. Um, so <laughs> when I'm talking to employers about apprenticeship, and I'll just use that as a context, any it could be any work based learning, uh, Derek, any strategy you might use. But two things they want to know: who's doing it, and how do you do it. And the how do you do it is really, really important. That's why I enlisted Ron's support in helping employers get over the wire. Um, they, they, have to, they have to know how to do it. <laughs> Literally, it may sound odd, but even as leaders, how do I support it? If, if support means I have to provide journeymen or, or, or people who are the mentors or whatever, that how piece is really a huge part of the change management. And so that's what I would say in my experience working with employers is that the, the how cannot be underestimated. Now, Ron, go ahead. Well, that's a great question. And, and I think that's part of the question uh, what, or part of the answer what uh, Rich was saying before. But there's also the issue about what it means in terms of how people get their work done and how they can um, achieve the outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And I think that one of the arguments that I make in organizations is based on the work that I've done before and I continue to do, and that's looking at the calculating the financial benefits of it. And so, you know, you ask people, what is their experience with a new hire coming into their areas? And they talk about, you know, repeated this, the same questions over and over. People ask, they're slow to get on the, you know, start doing things. They come up, they look like they're not being productive. There's some very interesting ways. And uh, what we do, Derek, is that we do these kinds of things up front. We find that, you know, when people talk about ROI and things like that, it's after the fact. And it, by that time, everybody's kind of not interested in it because in a sense, the, the horse is out of the barn. You've already done it and you can't do anything about it at that point. But what we've done is that we've done it from a forecast perspective. We've kind of looked at from our experience and looking at the actual activity within the organization. Like, for example, how long does it take a new person to learn a particular task in your organization? We can, we can do that. We've done that in many, many cases. And we can look at that and we can make a projection, a forecast of what it would be in terms of using SOJT. And that time difference typically works out to be about a factor of four to six in a proportion. Uh, you know, we've done, I don't want to say hundreds or anything like that, but could be close to hundreds of different cases and different organizations. As an average, it comes out to be about four to six times. In other words, it takes four to six times faster to learn whatever in a lot of different instances using SOJT than it does OJT or, you know, follow Joe or just kind of learning on the job kind of a situation, which means that if it takes a person one week to learn something, to be fully independent on a task, it may take them a day or a half a day using SOJT. And so the question then becomes for management is, is that investment in SOJT worth it in terms of both a financial outcome and also a you know, in terms of an annoyance factor as well, in terms of people not being productive, you know, not having anything to do, asking questions constantly, those kinds of things. And that's a management decision, putting it up front as opposed to spreading out the pain over a long period of time. I do know SOJT takes time. So, you know, the people on the floor, they have to decide how is it best to do it before the shift, after the shift, during times that are non-productive, there's, there's ways of doing it. But there has to be a way of saying, this is the value. This is what we're expecting to receive as a outcome, not a promise, but something we can document. So we do it up front and try to verify that after the fact. I don't know if that answers your question completely. I know there's a lot of social dynamics in there as well convincing people to do this but yeah I had the point definitely pulled some good context out of that I also heard in the how do you do it I, earlier in the chat people we were having a conversation a bit about teaching people to learn how to learn uh, that mm -hmm. learn how to learn importance but it makes me realize in the learn how to learn for our learners um, the support of helping managers understand 
how their new hires learn mm -hmm. um, maybe is, is a bit of the crucial missing piece there. And Absolutely. that might have been more of a push of information on our part rather than a collaborative effort with those leaders. And so right. coming back to some of that focus as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, le yeah. Le le learning is definitely a system that has to be taught as a system. No yeah. question. Yeah. And I, and I think this is a follow up a little bit. I, I think that's one of the things about SOJT. It gives organizations, employers involved with apprenticeships, a mechanism, the how. How am I going to do this? And it's something they can use also with their other employees as well. Okay. Don Wilkinson, next. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, so I actually had a similar question. So I got to change gears a little bit here. So uh, I guess my question is maybe more for Rich from the tech side of things. You know, this this concept of the competition for talent has been a buzzword or an expression that's been around for years. You know, you hear things about, you know, trying to become the employer of choice. Um, yeah, a decade ago, all the rage was around this sort of expectation for mass retirements particularly in the engineering and, and tech space. And I guess my question is, you know, do you see this, what we're going through now as, as different th than that? And, and if so, can you maybe share your thoughts on how it's different and what the impacts are gonna be? Yeah, it, because of remote work, Don, it absolutely is different. And that, that statistic I shared about that, that we got out of LinkedIn, one of seven job postings is, is remote. The, the labor pool has now gone from regional to national especially in technology jobs where, where truly remote work works because <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. It's not always desirable for leadership to, to promote ro remote work, but it's absolutely here to stay. And I don't think that horse is going back in the barn. So that's one of the fundamental uh, uh, dynamics in the marketplace that I think is something we have to pay attention to. So when I talk to people about apprenticeship, for example, um, the first thing we, the first question I ask employers is, are you open to this job or occupation being remote? If they say yes, it's a completely different conversation. Then it has to be someone regional, working with regional clients, billable hours, that sort of thing. Um, so that remote work factor, I'd say, is absolutely a driving factor. Great, thanks a lot. You bet. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Jay? Well, I'm going to sneak in with my own here. I'm curious for both of you guys, what do you see as the most important skills or missing skills that managers, supervisors, coaches have in, in terms of work-based learning strategies? Wow. <laughs> Ron, I'll you let, first. I'll you, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> For managers, um, from their perspective, from the perspective of managers, it's, you know, it's, it's been an evolving you know, there's the COVID has jolted so many managers and it's interesting what the literature is talking about now and practical literature as well. And that has to do with how do you manage and how do you evaluate remote workers? How do you do a performance appraisal when you're not keeping an eye on people? You're not mm -hmm. quite sure what they are doing. And uh, I think this technological or the this digital transformation thing is going to permeate through organizations. I don't think we're going to, people keep kept asking, are we going to bounce back after the COVID is over? And apparently it's not exactly going, it can never be the same. So I'm thinking there are some competencies in terms of being able to manage. And I think it also reinforces the notion of performance. You know, you're managing performance as opposed to just managing, watching people be able to do their jobs. So I think that's important. Thanks, Jay, for the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go ahead, Rich. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I'm going to go back to that work system issue. Leaders need to understand what is the what is the work system and how does the training interact with that work system? Because they're both systems. You know, think about fundamental input process output, right? Work, work, workflow, the, the learning system that we're deploying um, so they can see it. Procedural analysis for the, the, the process is really important, whether it be SJOT or curriculum based or whatever it might be. Um, you know, we're very content focused now in training because of e-learning. And we've kind of forgotten task analysis, procedural analysis, the, the work. But what does the work look like? So leaders have to understand how that stuff fits together. And so the systems view, I think, is really critical for leaders to, be, to, to function and, and to be on board. Great. Thank you both.
Hey, Laura, do you want to come off mute and ask your question or would you prefer I read it? I, I can come off mute. I think I just had a question because, um, you know, I think managers have so much on their plates today. And I think some do a really great job of encouraging this learning culture um, and encouraging their team to spend time developing themselves. And then there's others that maybe aren't as good of it or good at it and don't see the value. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering what advice do you have to get managers, sorry, I have a, a dog in the background. That's okay. Right? That's we, all do. Get, we all do. <laughs> to get managers to continue to prioritize learning among their teams um, when they're maybe not being rewarded or recognized for it? Like how are others making that work within their organizations? Ryan, want to take a stab? Well, I'm not sure I'm the one that asked that question. It sounds like somebody who's given that a lot more thought than I have. I mean, we are on the edges and the fringes of that question, obviously, uh, in a great in a great sense. But it has to do basically, I think, with evolving nature of managers themselves. What are the expectations of managers? It used to be with managers that development, developing their people was not an expectation. And I could see that many years ago when we asked people to be trainers. Um, people to be a trainer on the floor was a huge demand, extra demand on people and to have supervisors to be a trainer. Now, most job descriptions have all that information. So I think part of it has to do with where organizations start with, you mm -hmm. know, what they expect of their people. And it starts with, you know, what kind of values that the organization has. Yeah. So I would add to that, that um, Laura, if you want to know how good of a, how good a leader is going to respond to training and, and reinforce training, look at their skill in coaching. If, if leaders show up to coach, which is a development system, um, and basically coaching is good supervisory practice, if you will, if you want to look at it, it's broadest uh, definition, you'll know right away if they're going to be good supportive uh, uh, leaders of training. So I would say that is a really, really important attribute to, to monitor with your leadership. Okay, last question, Matt Haig. Awesome, well, thank you both for the presentation. Um, Ron, I was kind of curious, for those of us that are a little bit less familiar, can you uh, expand upon what the key difference is between SOTJ versus OTJ? Is it okay. really just more of this idea of really breaking down those tasks into the constituent parts? Or can you expand on that a little bit, please? Sure, sure. Well, when you think about SOJT, you're thinking about you're going to use a plan process, you know, just as you might with a, a classroom training program, if you use Addy or some kind of training design process, there is a design process for SOJT. So you're gonna follow some process. And that process is going to, in a sense, guide you to be able to decide if it's appropriate, to be able to analyze the work, you know, to identify the content that people are going to learn, that you're going to train the trainers, you're going to prepare the training materials, you're going to implement the training in a particular way, you know, you're going to make sure that the trainers have the skills and qualifications to do it, but they're going to follow just like you would do in a lesson plan, some organized way of doing it. And the emphasis is on outcomes, the performance. And so this idea of on the job training, you never know what's going to happen because the work has not been documented. You're not sure if the trainer is the qualified person, the best person to do it. There's all kinds of parts to that. So there's a, you know, what you're talking about in SOJT is that you're trying to make, just like any learning activity, you're trying to make it accountable. You're trying to make it the learning outcomes predictable and reliable so that trainees across trainees are going to get the same training more or less and so you can achieve the same outcomes over and over. You can't do that with OJT. Uh, you can't be sure about it. And there's no doubt, though, that there are some great trainers who, who, treat, who train their people very, very well without SOJT. But that's only because they have the skills and they have an intuitive sense. As we all know, we've watched people be really good trainers 
they have an intuitive sense of how to be an effective trainer. I don't know if that gives you a thumbnail sketch, Matt. Of yeah, Ron, Ron, I'm going to add one more thing. So when I was a practitioner leading training departments, one of the things that I reinforced with my teams is to use structured OJT to make sure you reach the level of mastery that you're trying to achieve with that student. And that is a fundamental difference between OJT and structured OJT. You have to, under, you have to know when a person has mastered the task. And without the structure and the design, you're not going to know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's critical. That's absolutely critical. Yeah. And that's, that's a big part of Ron's book too, by the way. Yeah. One thing, Matt, I'll just add here is that one of the misunderstandings about, misunderstanding about what we do with SOJT is that we're not developing experts. We're not developing expert employees with SOJT. That's impossible. What we're trying to do is get people to a level of independent performance that they can perform the tasks by themselves they can learn from that experience. They can move forward. They are not under supervision. They can work from that point forward. So as what Rich says, you know, it's achieving what it is that you want to achieve. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Hey, Mark, can you bring up our last slide for us? I can. Give me a second if you want to go ahead and start. Uh, and okay. I'll, I'll invite people to connect with us uh, independent of this conference call. So we'd love to have more conversation about this, please. And, and that's a good lead into uh, probably the last slide Mark's going to put up. But um, for our final task, um, we are asking you to say thank you to Rich and to Ron. And then we're also asking you to submit questions and we thought it would be kind of fun this time um, in your um, survey that we will send you. Um, and Mark just put that out on SurveyMonkey if you wanna go directly to it versus waiting for your email. Um, we're encouraging you to ask them questions. Rich and Ron are going to select the four best questions or at least the four <laughs> they're most interested in. And, and you four will have your question answered as well as um, you'll receive an, an autographed copy of one of Ron's books. So um, please take your time. I want to see you guys stump these two. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're smart, but they can be stumped. So come up Stop. with three questions. Can we please thank Rich and Paul um, with Chad or with you know the hands? Or if you want to come off mute and say thank you or clap, you can do that. Uh, Yay, well. Rich. So. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. Thank you guys. It was Thanks, fun. Fredrickson. And, yeah. And yeah, as absolutely. we're seeing the thank yous, Ron, last question. Someone wanted to know, just wanted to know where your picture was. They said it looked great. Your yeah. background picture. <laughs> Trinidad. Trinidad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ron. Wonderful way to start the day. Um, appreciate everyone spending their morning with us. And um, look for your, ask these guys great questions. I want, I want Rich and Ron to go, boy, these people are smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone. It's fun. Really fun. Have a great Thanks. day. Thank everyone. you everybody. Yeah, Thank bye. you everybody. Thanks. Bye. -bye.